Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of World Travel here at Scott County Public Library. With me today uh, is Dennis Slossel. Uh, he and his wife some time ago did a tour, uh, in fact more like an adventure out in the western states and he's here to talk about it and show some beautiful photographs uh, of what he and his wife saw out there. But before I let uh, Dennis get into the presentation, just a short bio of Dennis. Um, he and his wife have lived in Scott County for three years. Uh, prior to that, they lived in Wisconsin in Florida. Uh, Dennis worked for Johnson & Johnson. Yeah, um, and I'll get into that here in just a second. I just want to provide a little background before I get into the actual travelogue. Mm -hmm. um, and really, how, I'd like to think I'm a pretty smart guy, but in this instance, I wasn't. Uh, how this came about is we met some neighbors in Florida who had done this trip six times. And they were in their 70s, and they thought, well, I want to do it one more time. And we said, well, can we come along? And they said, well, of course. So it was really Bob and Pat that came up with this trip, and it was the best of the six times they had done before. Mm. So it was pretty impressive. Um, it basically was a trip that was 21 days long. It was We did it in July of 2015, so it's a little old, not a lot old. And like you said, it's referred to as a Grand Circle Tour, and I'll explain that with a picture in just a second. Um, I'm, the way I'm gonna do this is share some basic facts about the landmarks we saw, and then I'm gonna give you a bunch of pictures, because to me, the pictures tell the story. And it just is, uh, really, it's about a celebration of the beauty and the scale of these national treasures we have in our country. Um, just as perspective, I have a picture of where we are in Kentucky and where we want to actually arrived in uh, Arizona, just to give you a perspective of where we went. So here's the itinerary. We flew into Vegas. From there we went and hit a couple of parks. Basically went through Utah, Colorado, Arizona, and then back to Nevada to Las Vegas and flew out. It sounds like a short itinerary. Many of the cities we stayed at for two or three days. Quite a few of the cities had two or three parks or monuments that we visited when we stayed at that city. So it was really worked out pretty nice. And thank God Patton and uh, Bob had the itinerary all mapped out for us. We saw things I would have never imagined uh, existed in our country. It's always great to have a tour guide. Yeah, yeah, it worked out really, really well. Okay, so this slide shows why it's a circle. So we started at point A, obviously went B, C, D, so forth and so on, and we went in and out of Vegas, which I don't show in the circle, but again, you see the circle. We went from you know park to park to park over the 21 days. So we'll start with Zion National Park. That was our first stop. It's uh, located in Springdale, Utah, the southwestern part of the state. It was uh, Utah's first national park established in 1919. It's about 232 square miles, has 2,000 foot cliffs. I mean, it's just all kinds of topography, lots of narrow, deep canyons, it has a river. Um, and really when I talked about the size, 232 square miles, it's about 15 times bigger than Georgetown, so that, that's the scale that I talked about. I mean, it's just immense. You can't, you can't imagine it until you're there. Uh, the elevation change of about 5,000 feet from the highest point to the lowest point. Um, it has 1,000 species of plants, 78 species of animals, you know, a whole bunch of reptiles, amphibians, fish, and uh, 291 species of birds, lots and lots of birds, and we saw quite a few. Uh, we often and did see the endangered California condor soaring around, which was really pretty cool, and they also have the threatened spotted owls are there. They had 14 hiking trails which is what we, one of the biggest things we wanted to do was do lots of hiking. That way you get to really see the scenery up close or as close as you can get with 232 square miles. And this park had a shuttle bus that you could jump on and off of and it was free while well, it was included in entry. And I'll talk a little more about the entry fees a little later, how we handle that. So I'm just gonna take a second and you, you all can just look at the pictures 
I mean, the, the scenery was just incredible. Uh, here you can see on the circles, those were, I'm afraid of heights, I hate to admit it, but I am, and I just didn't want to go on this particular climb. So I stayed down while Bob and Pat went up, and you can see the circles show them already. They were, I think, less than halfway up the cliff, you know, how huge that cliff was in Zion. Uh, here you can see the river, one of the rivers that goes through it, and just, uh, again, the beautiful, breathtaking scenery. It's just, it really is something. If this is on your bucket list, take it off your bucket list, go. If you've been there, hopefully you're going to enjoy this, uh, revisiting the parks again Dennis, through the pictures. What, what uh, time of day is this? Um, maybe like mid-morning. So it's cooler part of the day then? Yeah. The weather was generally pretty good. I mean, we were, came from Florida, so it was hot in Florida, and so you know maybe we didn't see the feel the heat as much as somebody from up here. But generally, the weather wasn't too bad. Uh, the different colors and configuration of the rocks are really something else. Here you can see all the <clears throat> uh, again various colors. It just it really is something. in the different uh, configurations of the rock. This is the Narrows, and it's a, a little tricky, and I'll show you just a couple of pictures. You can see there's a, a river going through it, and you have to be careful if they get a, any bit of rain. That floods, and it has killed people. So if you know what the forecast is, and you have uh, rangers sitting there that say, okay, you can go today, but you know, you need to be back by a certain time, they'll let you go in. If they, they know there's a forecasted rain coming, just, they won't even let you go. And you literally do walk through water to take it all in, and you can just see it's, it's immense. So that's enough uh, Zion, now we'll get to Bryce. I hate to say this, because I don't want to benchmark anything against the Grand Canyon, but Bryce is one of my favorites, it's, and you'll see in the pictures, it really is something. Uh, it's in Bryce, Utah, in the southwest part of the state. I think we stayed at the same hotel and saw both of these um, parks. It was established in 1924, so it's quite old. It's at the top of the Grand Staircase, and it's not just a single canyon, it's a series of amphitheaters and bowls, and you'll see it when you see the pictures, what it really looks like. And the one distinctive thing it does have are hoodoos and their columns, irregular shaped columns of rock. Again, you'll see those, and that just comes through, you know, weathering and erosion and all that the geological stuff I don't quite understand. So it's 56 square miles. It was very small. You could walk around quite a bit of it. Um, it was reasonably high again, and it had 15 hiking trails. Again, we probably had three or four uh, the day or two we were there that were easy or hard. And you could easily drive through it. It had 18 miles of roads. Um, there was, I don't think there was a bus service, but driving through it was very, very easy. So this is Bryce. Again, you can see all the sand configurations and rock formations and all the vivid colors. And again, I tried to get the scale. If you look in the background, I mean, it's just, it's immense, everything you're looking at. And all these uh, columns, you can see one in the foreground a little bit. Those are the hoodoos, and we'll get better pictures of them shortly. If you go look towards the left, you'll see a bunch of them. Dennis, uh, the word hoodoo, is that uh, an Indian word or Spanish word, or what is that? I'm guessing it is. I really didn't look that closely into it. Um, it sh certainly sounds like it might be. Yeah. Uh, and here's the amphitheater that they talked about, and you can see the hoodoos very clearly. I mean, they look small, but they're obviously pretty massive once you get in there. Uh, another really great picture, I think, highlighting some of the different colors you're going to see at the, in the amphitheater. And just a real close-up of the hoodoos. It was really pretty cool. We got to walk through them, you'll see here shortly. And here we are going through some of them, just walking through the amphitheater. I 
mean, the structures, again, are massive and just all kinds of configurations and colors. It was really something. And here you can see just how massive some of these walls are, where the hoodoos are, the base of the hoodoos. And that's the end of Bryce. Next we'll talk about the Capitol Reef National Park. This one is in South Central Utah. It was established in 1937. Again, uh, so far the three we've looked at are really pretty old. Uh, it's a hidden treasure filled with cliffs, canyons, domes, and bridges. In the water pocket fold, it's just a geological fixture uh, extending about 100 miles. This one's about 60 square miles. So it's about four times the size of Georgetown. Again, this is one of the smaller ones, but I mean, it's still pretty massive. This actually has 200 miles of trails, and there are 15 day hike trails. Again, we spent a lot of time on them. Uh, here you can see, like, we just happen to be driving by, and this is like sitting on the side of the road. <laughs> this massive side, no, stop, we're going to take a picture, you know, because we did a lot of driving during the trip. So it was just really something. And this one, the next one, you can see it has just kind of crazy colors in an unusual pattern. Normally you see them like, I guess, horizontally, and this one's a combination of horizontal and vertical. Again, we were just driving by and stop, I want a picture of this thing. That was, uh, Capitol Reef was one that was primarily a drive-by. You just kind of drove through the park and you know, obviously it took pictures. I had 1,200 pictures. I don't know if I mentioned this before and just pared it down to about 80. I added a few more as you know from when we started. The next one's uh, Arches, which I'm sure many of you have heard about. Again, this one's in Utah and Moab, Utah. Moab, Utah was really kind of a neat city. It has a lot of mountain biking there, a lot of trails. It was the thing that I noticed. I'm a relatively avid cyclist. I don't do more road biking than mountain biking, but there were a lot of trails and you continually saw people on there. You know, mountain bikes going all over town and out into the mountains. Uh, this one was a national monument in 29 and became a national park in 71. Uh, and I'll just explain the difference between a monument, a park and a monument. A park is typically uh, set aside by Congress for the use of the people of the U.S. And national monuments are areas reserved by the national government because they contain, you know, historic, prehistoric, or, of, or they're of scientific interest. Basically, if it's a national monument, from what I understand, the president designates it, and if it's a, and that, those are um, monuments or parks that the um, president can either make bigger, expand, or contract at his or her desire. And parks are basically law, so they can never change. So it's much better to have a park because it will always be there, whereas a national monument can occasionally change at the whim of the president. It has 2,000 natural arches. We saw, I think, I don't know, about three or four. So we just saw a very, very small part of it. Uh, it's 120 square miles, about eight times the size of Georgetown. Uh, there's a one-way drive, scenic drive, and uh, you can see the elevation changes are minor compared to some of the other places we visited. It's, it's relatively flat. Um, and there were quite a handful of really short trails. It was a little bit of a hike to get to the primary, from the parking lot to the primary arch, but it wasn't, you know, terrible. And one thing I will say, if you're going to do this trip, I would encourage you to prepare. Hike every day for months, go to the Pinnacles, go to any of the parks we have. Um, what's the bridge, natural bridge, par any of those parks, just really prepare, because the more you're able to hike, the more you're gonna see and enjoy, you know, these really these incredible landmarks. So this is the pathway that we took from the parking lot to the arches that we looked at, the primary arches. 
And there were other structures, as you can see, these aren't necessarily arch, because you'll see an arch is kind of like a bridge, like the one we have here, the stone bridge or natural bridge. And then here's one of the arches, and they're just massive. I mean, again, I tried to put people in pictures so we all could get an idea of just how big they are. You know, just incredible what nature gives us sometimes, it really is. And this is all here, this is all American. There are so many things that we can enjoy. Here's the base of one of the arches. It's massive, isn't it? Yeah. And here's another perspective. Obviously, it took from a little ways away. And again, you can see how grand, how big it is. And you know, the arch almost looks small, but relative to the size of a person, it's still massive. And that's just, again, showing some of the scale of some of these places. Canyonlands National Park. So this was not too far from Moab. We did stay a few days in Moab, so a couple of parks. It became a park in 64. This one's really one of the bigger ones at 527 square miles, about 30 plus times the size of Georgetown. Uh, it has four districts. There's an island in the sky, Needles Maze, and a couple of rivers. You'll see most of this. Uh, hundreds of miles of hiking trails and 18 day hike trails again you can that's what a lot of people do go there just to hike and camp we just did a little bit of hiking to take in the sites uh, there you can boat on the rivers rock climb backpacking also are pretty popular and and here you can see this one was a little on the flat side that was why it's called a canyon land but you know it's just massive all the different outcroppings, all the different um, little hills and mountains, it just, and all the colors, just something else. Uh, there's a Horseshoe River in here. We did make a stop there, obviously, to look down. I've seen that before. Yeah, some of this stuff's relatively popular, you'll see, and there's one in specific I'll mention when I get into the uh, uh, slot canyons. Again, another perspective. You can see the river. There must be a small lake out there that the river feeds. <coughs> this is Dead Horse State Park, which is part of the canyon lands, and we also ran into that. Many of the national parks would have state or local parks within or next to the park. So that's why we saw 20 parks, because sometimes they were almost overlapping. But I think we saw all of about 13 like major monuments or major parks. Again, just the, the, the way it, the formations and everything. And in the middle here, you can see that's actually a road. That may be the road that we drove to get there. And you can see the river on the right a little bit. The next one is the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. Uh, this one's in Utah, still in Utah, almost at the border of Arizona. It became a national monument in 96 and it was expanded in 17. It's a million acres. I mean, this was by far the biggest. We saw parts of it, but you know, it's relatively flat and obviously very expansive. And, you know, I'll show you some of the um, different parts of it, you'll, you'll get a good sense of it through the pictures. It's about the size of Rhode Island and a hundred times bigger than Georgetown, so again, it was really massive. Uh, the Trump administration, it will be reducing it by half. He came out and said that a year or two ago. It does include Lake Powell, which folks may have heard of, that I think is in Arizona, and it has another horseshoe bend. So that's a, another one like we saw in the previous. 20 day hike uh, trails, lots of you know, fishing, boating, kayaking, mountain climbing, mountain biking, all sorts of things. So here's the first picture. You can see it's a road there kind of in front of us. Maybe the rocks aren't quite as colorful, but I mean, it's just massive. And, and you'll see there are quite a bit of color in the rocks. Again, well, this was one we drove through. There wasn't necessarily a, a contained, like, canyon or something. So I'm just showing pictures as we were driving along. Again, this massive 
structure would just you know, go around the corner and there it was. Here you can see the road going through it. I'm sure this is one of them that we drove. There aren't many roads through some of these beautiful parks. I wanted to ask you, what uh, are the roads in pretty good condition? Yeah, they are very good condition. There was only one Moki Dugway, and I'll talk about that. It was really pretty, and that one was another really interesting one. Mesa Verde National Park. Uh, the Spanish meaning is green table. It's known for its cliffside structures. You'll see those in just a second. Uh, the park has more than 5,000 sites, including 600 cliff cliff dwellings and 40 miles of roads. It's the largest archaeological preserve in the U.S. It's near Cortez, Colorado. It became a park in 1906, so so far this is the oldest. And its size is about five times the size of Georgetown and a variety of trails and even some guided trails. Everywhere we went, there were guided options available. Um, the folks we went with had done it so many times, we just they just pointed us in the direction and, you know, there we went. So here's again some more of the formations. This one was a little unusual how it kind of sat up on top and just a different type of formation. And you'll see underneath the surface there, vaguely, you'll see people. So again, just you can see how big it is. And then also the structures where uh, folks lived. And we'll get in there and there they are. This is where families and lived. And it's really something. All the different structures are still there. And it's all carved, I'm thinking. And are these uh, Pueblo Indians? I think so. Because I've seen something like this in uh, oh, near Flagstaff, or was Okay. So yeah, this one, I, well, this is in Utah, but it's right next to Arizona, so it's probably in the same general area, so I would, I would imagine, yes. Very similar. Yeah, the Cliff Palace. Some of the trails were pretty interesting. Here was one where if you're just slightly overweight, you'd have a hard time getting through it. <laughs> Thankfully, I, my diet was paying off when we both got through, Mary and I. And hieroglyphics, I think that's how you pronounce that. Oh, this had something to do with they were predicting that UK was going to have how many championships? <laughs> something yeah, along those that. lines. They have profits back then. <laughs> <laughs> the next one we'll look at is the Mexican hat formation. This was just one rock we drove by on the way in between two different uh, locations. This one's a little different. It's, you'll see it literally looks like a sombrero. Uh, it's 60 feet wide and 12 feet high. The hat has two, uh, you can climb, on, climb it. It uh, has frequently been noted on a list of unusual places, place names. It's near Bluff, Utah. Uh, it's a self-governing entity, which is a uh, census-designated place. I'm not exactly sure what that means. It just stuck out at me when I read about the background. It's a uh, pretty small, and it, it, like I said, you basically just drive by. So this was on the way to Mexican Hat, and again, you can see the unusual colors and the sediment, and really how it just fell into place, I guess, through thousands, millions of years, I'm guessing. And there's the hat, mm. and it does look like a sombrero. This is a nice picture with all the contrasting colors. And here it is up close. It wasn't huge, but it was still, you know, pretty massive. It certainly the, is different, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Again, that was just a drive-by. And what causes those formations? Uh, wind and sand, or? I'm guessing, I, I'm not a geologist. <laughs> I just didn't do that much investigation into it. The trip was primarily about taking it all in. Yeah. So the next thing we did was uh, Moki Dugway, and, and this is a road. It's really interesting, it's just gravel. Um, and this is another one that we had our tour guides, Bob and Pat had not shown us this, we would have never have found it. 
Uh, it's part of the Bear Ears National Monument, 2,000 square miles, so I mean it's massive. Uh, this was one that Trump's going to reduce by 85 percent. It was constructed in the 50s, so it's not extremely old, and it's basically a path or a, a very narrow, windy road that uh, folks in the 50s used to haul ore from a mine to uh, Helchita near the Mexican hat. It's in, near, it's in Utah. Uh, what Mulkey refers to, I just, the name is kind of interesting, and that's why it, it sounds was. Sounds Hawaiian almost. Yeah, I know, yeah. Uh, it's derived from the Spanish word Moki, which is a general term used by explorers to describe Pueblo Indians. Dugway is a term used to describe a roadway carved from a hillside. So, and that's exactly what it is. This was, again, I hate heights. I was literally holding on to the, the other guy I drove. I was literally holding on. I mean, it's just, you're right on the edge. You know, it's hundreds of feet down. It was really something else, but it just was really pretty cool. So it's a graded dirt switchback road carved out into the face of a cliff. Uh, it's about three miles. It's very steep, not very well, you know, unbathed. It has very extreme grades. 11% doesn't sound like a lot, but it is if you actually were there. And it just uh, winds through the, the area there. You say this was gravel? Yeah, it was gravel. Did you have a four-wheel drive vehicle? No, I mean, it was... Not like big gravel. I mean, we had just uh, basically a uh, minivan because yeah, okay. there were four of us with our luggage. It was a lot of luggage because it was three weeks. Um, but that it wasn't terrible in terms of being rough. And here's the first picture, and you can see just how it yes. meanders through the mountain. And think about this in the 50s. How the heck did they? I mean, it wasn't like they had the machinery we have now that they were able to dig this out, I can only imagine how many years it took them to do it. And how many people. Right, right. And I just wanted to show kind of the, how much of a hairpin some of them were. And what you can see with this one is it's extremely long. Because there were people, goofballs I guess, they had massive RVs. So they had to extend them so they could get around it. And why somebody in a large vehicle would do this, I mean, maybe to see the site, I get that, but it was really something. And again, this is part of the canyon lands we saw a little earlier, so that's what you would see like when you got on top, because you do this meandering road all the way to the top, and then we just turn around and went back down. Thank God I had the pens, I was pretty scared. <laughs> All right, the next one is the slot canyons. I know you said those were some of the pictures you oh. enjoy the most, and it really is something. Yeah, it's like another world. Yeah, it, it, and the pictures are really neat, but being there, it's just so much more impressive, like any of these. And again, if it's on your bucket list, go. <laughs> um, it's on uh, Navajo um, tribe land. It's in the middle of Arizona. And there were two slot canyons, and basically they're referred to as a slot canyon because you stand on top of the ground and you literally walk down into the canyon, and they're about 200 feet down. So you're going down pretty far. There's an upper and a lower, the crack in a corkscrew. I'm sure there's a reason they were called that, but the two of them in there are slightly different. Um, and here's just a little bit about how they were formed through erosion of the sandstone. Uh, you know, I won't get into that. You can take just a second here to read through it. You know, just erosion, etc. And it's what was really interesting is they were across the road from each other, so you could literally do one, and then in the afternoon just do the second one, or vice versa. <clears throat> it was a little pricey. I think they were sixty or seventy bucks at the time, but it was well, well worth it. And it was all done um, by. Native Americans, you know, they had ties to the land and I think really appreciated it. And the narrative was very, very good. I, this was at the top of my list. I mean, I love the Grand Canyon. I'm so glad we saw it. It's certainly there, but between Bryce and the Slot Canyons, those were some of my favorites, including the Grand Canyon. 
So this is what it looks like when you're up on top before you dig into it. Obviously you can see some people crawling down in there and you know we're all taking pictures and the contrast and the colors are just really pretty cool. So you couldn't, there was no elevator. Again, this is why you need to do a lot of hiking and you really need to prepare. This is very steep and you're going down 200 feet. So it's, you know, pretty good hike. You have to be in reasonable shape. And yes, those are rocks. I mean, it doesn't look like it, but they're rocks. Something. Yeah, just the way, again, you can just see it. The one on the left, you can see the heads of people. So again, just showing a little bit of the scale. And then my wife was in front of me and our buddy Bob, who was our tour guide. And you can see on the right, they're going through some of the slots. And this is the lower slot. Now I have a couple of slides with the upper slot as well. Dennis, do you ever see any wildlife in these slot canyons, like rattlesnakes or anything like that? We didn't, and I'm guessing because it was so populated, like they did groups of maybe 30 at a time, and they were just back to back to back to back. You had to get on like a day or two in advance to reserve a spot. Okay. You know, it was, it, this was in July, so this was peak season, which was one of it. So I'm guessing just because there was so many people there, whatever, you know, animals were, critters were there, were gone. Again, this is a rock formation. Way at the bottom, you can see somebody's head there, just again to show the scale and colors and the textures. I mean, it really is it's something else. I, yeah. Sorry I'm like a broken record, but yeah. it really was something. But it something. looks like uh, the surface of Mars or something. Yeah, I know. Yeah. It's yeah it, especially that. <laughs> yeah, look at that. Kind of, I'm colorblind. I think that's sort of an orangey. Yes, it is. Just a different uh, way the rock is shaped. And it's all smooth. It's nothing really sharp. Again, just another perspective, the colors, the formations. The lighting just added so much to it. I'm an okay photographer, but it's easy to be a great photographer when all you have to do is snap the picture and this is the kind of stuff you get. Yeah, one of the things I want to ask you is about photography. If you have any tips yeah. or what kind of equipment, stuff like that. So. Yeah, I just had a... Um, I had a Sony, I forget, a mirrorless, a little nicer camera. It wasn't anything crazy. You could get any kind of um, DLSR. I'm sure you do just fine. And what was nice was the guide grabbed everybody's camera and set it. Because, you know, you had, you can see you had some dark and light, you know, the lighting got to be a little crazy. Mm -hmm. So he knew what would be the best configuration of manual controls to get the best pictures. That's service. Yeah, it really was. I mean, he went from, you know, person to person. You know, one of my more favorite pictures, again, it just shows you all the different formations that the rocks have. This is the eagle. I, now, how did that happen? That it just turned out that way? I mean, I don't know. It just, it really is something. I mean, it does look like it. It does. Now, what do you see here? The maiden? The maiden. Like Over. here's the face and the hair is yes. flowing back. Yes. Again, it's just, you're walking through this and here's the stuff you're seeing. You can see a lot in there. Yeah. You looked long enough. Yeah, I know. <laughs> It's like looking at a cloud. Yes. <laughs> and of course the shark, the infamous shark. The shark. I don't know what his name is. You probably should give him a name. That's pretty cool. Again, these are just uh, erosion through the thousands, millions, however many years that these came about. So that was the lower can Antelope Canyon. Now we'll go to the upper. It's slightly different, but not as different. You know, not that much different. More light came through, which is why this is maybe a little lighter and you get more difference in the colors. Now you can see some of the texture of the rocks. I mean, that could almost be somebody right there on the left. Now the detail is amazing there. Yeah, yeah. You know, and this is just an average camera. 
The Upper Slot Canyon, I, when we did the tour, we were told by the guy that uh, Windows, you get some default screensavers, you know, pictures. They did a bunch of them here at, at the Upper Slot Canyon. And I'll show you the one I think that is somewhat close to what you would see on you know, your PC as a screensaver, one of the default pictures you get. He threw up sand and on the left, and that's what you got. It just emphasized some of the coloring. Uh, this one, some of the spaces were a little smaller. You can see it's not quite as massive. Again, on the right, you can see just the different colors. This is the one that you see on Windows as one of the screensavers. It's something very similar to this. And yes, it's a, again, these are rocks in the canyon. It's just, and I didn't do it, I did not use any filters. I didn't use, it was just straight out of the box, you know, point and click. You know, and I've seen, I've seen a man's face looking at us. Uh oh. There's the mouth. Over here? On yeah. the left? Yeah, two eyes. And there's yeah. a mouth and a nose. Yeah, that one protrusion over, yeah. over there. Yeah, I mean, it, I'm sure there were many of them. The three they pointed out were on the tour, and I mean, they were really, really, like the size of this room big. Like the eagle and the shark and stuff. <clears throat> but yeah, just in, on the left, upper left, you can see some of the detail of the rock, knowing that it is rock. And this is the upper slot canyon. So you can see why those were some of my favorites. Dan and Bryce, I just like the colors and everything. And finally, we got to the Grand Canyon after, I don't know, 18 or 19 days. It's in Grand Canyon, Arizona. And I didn't realize this, but there really are a, a conglomeration of parks and monuments in it. It's uh, established as a park in 1919. There are two parts of it, the north and the south rim. I think the south rim, it, yeah, is the most accessible and we spent most of our time there. It was easy to get around. We literally just drove it and they had ample parking. We were there in July, you know, kind of peak season, so it wasn't horrible, horrible. We had some weights sometimes, but it, considering it was peak season in 2015, is when we went, it wasn't bad. <clears throat> you know, you're up there pretty high at 7,000 feet. The rim, north rim is just a little higher and isn't quite as popular. I think a lot of that has to do with accessibility. Did you get to the, you, see, you say you were on the south rim? Primarily, we did, did get to the north. Did you uh, get to the El Tavar Hotel there on the south rim? I don't. Is I don't know. It's we were there many years ago. Oh, okay. And it's a converted hunting lodge. Oh, okay. And it's magnificent. It has a great view of the uh, South Rim, and they have a great dining room there. And at that time, they had a professional chef. Oh so wow! You had, a, you had a great meal. Right. And you had this great view. It was yeah, yeah. Something. We did stop at one of the lodges, and had lunch there, and it was extremely impressive. And you could tell it was from the. 20s or 30s and they still kept that old charm so that may have been it I don't know um, you can see if you drove the thing it's 220 miles but if you actually walked it it's 21 and, and the walking is really something else there are 13 day hike trails the rim has six uh, you have to be very careful careful when you hike it about 250 people get rescued every year um, and I think you actually pay for it and when you're hiking you every let's say half a mile or so there's a ranger there and they look you square in the eye and make sure you're still there because you get so easily dehydrated and you know it was pretty hot it was in the 80s when we went again it was July it was su summer um, so you have to be very, very aware of that, and they'll chase you right back up if there's any kind of a problem. We hiked the Bright Angel Trail, which is the most popular, and it's, it's extremely steep, <clears throat> and I'll show you some pictures of that. So here's uh, just one of the pictures. This doesn't show necessarily the scale as much as some of the others will, uh, but again, you can see the, the, the terrain and the different picture, um, colors and mm -hmm. contrasts. Um, if you start on the left, you'll see the there's kind of a 
valley, that's where the Colorado River is. And I'll, I'll show you, uh, there you can see it much better. You can see a little bit of it on the uh, left, kind of mid, middle left, and you'll see the valley where the river kind of goes through. And this is you know, a much better picture to show you how massive this thing is. What, what time of day is this? Is this around noon or something? Yeah. I don't remember if we did this before or after our hike. And we spent a couple of days. This was another one where we, I think we actually spent three nights. So we went back a few times. Because okay. what I remember, uh, the contrast of colors, uh, during the noontime you got all the grays and blues mm -hmm. and the rocks. And then during uh, sunrise and sunset, all these brilliant oranges and reds came out. It was magnificent. It really yeah, was. we didn't make it early or late. Yeah. Unfortunately, and I've seen pictures, just incredible pictures. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> you can see again, we're probably at 7,000 feet up, looking down at the river. Just another perspective. This was at the start of the Bright Angel Trail. And I'll show that just shortly. You know, the sky and the different colors and contours. All these little lines you're seeing, mm -hmm. those are all the trails. I mean, there are just all kinds of them. Um, down here on the left, on the bottom, towards the bottom, this is where the Bright Angel Trail is, and this is the stopping, like the midway stopping point. That's where the ranger looks you in the face? Well, they're all along the way. Okay. That's like three miles down. So you've seen a couple of them on your way down, and you'll see them on the way back. So this is the Bright Angel Trail. I know it's a little difficult to see, but it's right in the middle. And if you start where the trees are, you can see the path. And there, that's the outcropping that I pointed to a little earlier that's sort of in the middle, um, just up a little bit. And there's a little um, building you can stop at and sit down for just a minute. There are you know, no refreshments or anything, but you can stop and get in the shade. And that was three miles. So we did a total of six and it was exhausting. I mean, I don't mind, I try to be active. We do a lot of walking, I ride my bike a lot, but it was really tough. So it was six miles down? Three miles down, three, three miles, miles back. back. And there are points when the grade is pretty steep. You know, and there are points when it is, and, and it's full of people, it's kind of fun. You know, everybody's having a good old time, but again, if you're gonna do something like this, <clears throat> if you wanna take it in like we did, you really need to do a lot of hiking, really a lot of hiking. That way you can enjoy something like this. You can go another three miles down if you um, look up and down, you'll see the path keeps going down to the Colorado River, and there's a place you can stay at overnight and then hike back. We did not do that. The people we traveled with were, they were older, so they weren't interested in doing anything like that. If we ever did go back, we probably would do that. Because then you can take in that whole trail and really you know, get down to the bottom. My son did it when he was in high school. That was his class trip. He went all the way down and, and uh, camped and came all the way up. And he said it was really pretty something. And it was, even for him at 17 years old, was pretty exhausting, it was pretty demanding. Now, do they still use donkeys for some people? Yes, that's the alternative you do have. You can hire them, and you'll see them occasionally. They're on a different path, but they'll be, you know, going down and up just like we are. Yeah, that is the Bright Angel Trail. And that's it for the pictures of the Grand Canyon. So just a couple of closing thoughts. Uh, if you consider going to the Grand Canyon, I really would encourage you to do some version of the Grand Circle. You don't have to see 20 parks like we did, but they're all really close. We drove, um, I don't know, like 1,500 miles. I mean, it was a lot of driving, but generally we never drove more than an hour or two. We had one or two instances where we drove four or five hours, but they really are pretty close. And the hotels were... You know, we stayed at the Motel 6 and just really discounted hotels because we wanted, we weren't in the room other than to sleep. So 
again, I would just encourage you to do as much as you want. I have the itinerary available. If anybody wants it, I'll share my email address. Okay. If anybody has questions, and I can maybe explain, if you only could do half, what would you do, or you know, any kind of version of that. Uh, what we did is ahead of time, we plotted it all out. You know, Bob, we took out a map, we got on the phone, and we spent the whole afternoon we're you know, going to stay here and then we're going to stay here. And we just called the hotels and mapped them all out in one day and got them all locked in. We did that in spring and we went in July. Mm -hmm. you know, obviously, they get very busy. I want to say we did it in maybe January or February. Uh, there are tour companies. If you go on the web, you'll see them that do this. And we would quite often see a, like an a oversized minivan with eight or ten people in it stop and you'd see them kind of piling out like at the arches and Grand Canyon and they were obviously on some sort of a tour so there are available I don't know what they cost or how they operate so that is an option uh, again you're gonna if you want to do the version we did lots of walking you know prepare go to the Berea to Natural Bridge there's plenty of places for hiking to us that's how we enjoyed it because we you know, like I kept saying we could just walk and see a lot of it Got get up close. I was I thought the Grand Canyon by far would be the best. I mean by a long shot, but I was surprised by Bryce and the Slot Canyons. We talked a little bit, then they ended up on the top of our list. Uh, they're just immense. It's really you want to move along and try and take in as much as you can as quickly as possible. It cost us about sixty five hundred bucks. And we did maybe the deluxe version because it was three weeks, it was darn near a month. And the other thing is, if you're a senior wanting to do this, for $80 for your lifetime, you get a pass to all the national parks. I would just encourage you to buy that now, even if you won't go for a year or two. When we bought it in 2015, it was free. Hmm. Or I guess we didn't buy it, but... So now they decided to charge $80. I don't even know if it's still $80. And you can see there are military passes, uh, discounts available as well. And just as an example, Bryce alone was 35 bucks just for seven days. So if you're gonna do something like that, you'll get the payback on that. And it's for a lifetime. So any national park you go to anywhere in the country, you'll be able to use it. So that was one thing, you know, if you're gonna do that, I would, you should all consider doing that. Uh, thanks for letting me share my slides. I can see I'm pretty passionate. We really enjoyed the trip. And I hope you all enjoyed it as much as, as we did. If you have any questions, you see my email address. You know, just drop me a note and I'll gladly give you any perspective. Okay. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you is, uh, are you planning to do this again? We'd love to, but there are so many other great places. Like we haven't been to Yosemite, or you know, we haven't been out to California, seen those, the petrified for it. So we want to do some of those. We may go back, and if we did, I think we'd do the Grand Canyon and we'd do that whole hike. If That's, we're still physically able to. That was my next question. What would you do differently? Yeah, I, again, yeah. that was one. And I think um, because the folks we went with were a little older and it was harder for them to get around, <clears throat> We generally shut down at one or two or three in the afternoon. I think if it was just us, we'd get up early, get the sun, some of the sunrises, we'd stay late, get some of the sunsets, you know, spend more time there. It was just getting hard for them, and they had done it so many times, I think they, you know, like, eh, hey, we've been there before. And, you know, for us it was new, and we just wanted to be respectful of their time. Certainly. Now, it, it sounds like uh, it's wonderful for hikers, and you, you went to great lengths to explain how you should get prepared for hiking. Uh, there's another place, uh, you know, we talked about Pinnacles and Berea and things like that, but there's also Skullbusters here in Scott County. Uh, I hike there quite a bit, you can prepare there. So, but uh, you mentioned you went in July. Yes. Um, is there a, another season that might be a better choice than the hot season? Um, I don't know, everything's open. You might be able to go in spring and maybe it's a little less expensive mm -hmm. in some availability, but I think the parks are kind of hit and miss in terms of when they open and when they close because a lot of it depends on like the snow and you know the conditions, the climate. Mm -hmm. I mean it was hot. I mean there were days when it was hot like it is now in the 90s, 
but you just drink and you know we maybe didn't hike as much but everything was open and we had access to everything you know that was a big thing or maybe you could go in August I just think you know kind of that May June July August September that's probably the the meat you know the best time to go just because everything's available now what about for non-hikers uh, is this uh, <laughs> is this worthwhile this kind of trip I think so absolutely I think there are I would be very careful to pick the parks you go to because like the arches it was a you know, we probably had like 30 minutes to get there and it was a little rough. Mm. So that one maybe you don't do. And it's not like you can see the arches from the road. You actually have to walk in. So I would just do some homework and maybe you do a, some subset of them. Like the Grand Canyon, you could literally stay in your car. You know, because the road is like right next to the canyon. And you could just park and walk, you know, like 10 feet and you're on a pathway and you can take it all in. So. And Bryce wasn't bad. Zion had a bus. So I think there are enough of them that, you know, if you aren't maybe able to, you know, do a bunch of hiking, you can still see some pretty cool stuff. I really loved your photographs and I really liked your presentation. It was something you made me want to do this now. I hope so. I've got a bucket list of things I want to do, and I've done some of them, but this is definitely one I want to do. So, well, Dennis, uh, do you have any final thoughts? Uh, not really. I just hope everybody enjoyed it. Uh, you know, we obviously did, and the pictures I thought would help convey um, really what the parks are all about. And, you know, we should all be proud of these beautiful, you know, parks and monuments we have available to us for virtually free. Very good. Well, that's about it, folks. Uh, I do want to mention that here at the library, uh, we do have different resources. We have books. And we have DVDs about the national parks, uh, the national parks that Dennis just uh, presented about. So feel free to come into the library Monday through Saturday from 1 to 7 o'clock and check out some of these fabulous books. There's some great photographs in here, but they're not quite as good as Dennis's photographs. I was really impressed with this. So take care, folks. See you later. Mm -hmm.